Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar on the topic of investing in Israeli science and research. Israel's high-tech medical and science accomplishments are world-renowned, and many of its researchers have been at the forefront in the fight against COVID-19 in Israel and abroad. This global pandemic has impacted all of us and underscores the critical role of medical and scientific expertise. Today, we are joined with longtime funders of science and one leader within the Israel academic research community to learn different approaches to funding research in Israel and what we have learned and what was, has been learned along the way. We will also discuss the role of funders um, and what they can do and play to play in strengthening the infrastructure needs for research and different opportunities for collaboration. We are fortunate to have wonderful a wonderful panel and we um, we will be open for questions and we hope to get to many of them at the end of the at the end of the webinar. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, throughout the webinar to ask your questions. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Kim McCabe, the executive director of the Klarman Family Foundation to get us started today and introduce her fellow panelists. Thank you, Kim. Great. Hello, and thank you, Tamar, um, and to everyone with an interest on this uh, call. If you had asked me um, 13 years ago when I started with the Klarman Family Foundation, if I thought I would be here talking about scientific research in Israel and the role of private philanthropy, I would have thought that you were crazy. It was certainly not um, either a focus of the Klarman Family Foundation at the time, nor an area of expertise uh, for me personally. So um, I say that because as there's been increased questions, I know we have received and other funders and through JFN over the past several years about funding and research. Um, and it hasn't really been an area, sort of a subset within the JFN network per se, or at least formally um, for areas of interest. It's a, it's a journey and it's one that non-scientists certainly can take and become invested in. Um, at this point in time, I think given that we're doing this remotely, all from our homes or um, other offices, Israel's a little bit further ahead than uh, me outside of Boston, um, but it's clear that COVID-19 and the way it has touched the entire um, globe and had its ripple effects, it's really put an emphasis on the importance of understanding um, what's happening with the virus, with the disease, and the importance of research. And it has been incredible to see the global research community really come together to help address what is um, a critical issue for all. Um, so it seems timely to have a very introductory uh, session today to talk about what does it mean to invest in science, and more specifically in Israeli, um, in real Israeli science and research. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, we have an hour, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what this session is and what it is not, because within an hour, um, we can certainly not touch on all that there is to say about either the Israeli scientific and research landscape, all the ways that one can invest in research, um, and even a, a whole scope of what, what is that research landscape, which is vast. This session is going to be drawn on the experience of those you're seeing on the screen for those of us and primarily um, focused in biomedical research, which also seems apt given that we're talking about this during um, a global pandemic. Um, and we are going to get a sample. Um, we're going to share sort of a little bit of the journeys we've had in terms of the, the funders and foundations that we represent, um, have both the North American ex, uh, perspective as well as Israeli perspective from um, a funder in Israel, and then also from um, a scientist and head of one of the, not just Israel, but the world's leading um, research and in, in academic institutions to give some perspective on what does it mean for private um, philanthropy to become involved in um, funding research. So there will be, we're going to go again, it's more of a, um, a very much an intro. I know that um, each of us is uh, available and able to follow up with more in-depth conversations if you have them about the, the path and journey we have each taken and what we've learned. We'll share some of that today. And I know that JFN is happy to consider additional sessions um, virtually or hopefully when there is another in-person conference um, to have more time to explore. 
But for, day, for today, um, I, I will start um, talking a little bit about the Klarman Family Foundation's journey in terms of uh, research and research in Israel. Um, and we'll have uh, my colleagues, um, Ruth Salzman from the Russell Berry Foundation, Asha Reagan from Yad Hanadiv, um, follow up with a similar sort of overview and, and highlighting a couple of aspects of uh, their investments in research, um, in research in Israel. And then we'll have a, an opportunity to hear from Uri on his perspective about the value um, of private funding to not just um, one institution, but sort of in the landscape of Israeli academic research. So I am, and we're not, I'm not going to take a long time. We'll wait, weave some questions in between. Um, and also at the end, as Tamar indicated, have an opportunity to address questions. Um, so when I said that I would not have expected that the Klarman Family Foundation and I personally would be talking to you about investing in research in, in, in Israel, the foundation, while it's always had an interest in a number of um, health related um, issues, did not begin funding in any area of science until um, about uh, a little over 10 or 12 years ago. And the foundation had an interest in um, eating disorders and other psychiatric uh, diseases. And in asking the question that we often ask of all areas, um, what is the role of private philanthropy in addressing this issue? Um, we began a journey um, as we do with other topics talking to other funders who have been invested in, kind, in, in um, a specific issue area or disease and how they went about it. And we commissioned a landscape to say, what would make a difference in helping to, um, uh, helping really better understand eating disorders. And that led to um, a suggestion that the foundation actually invest in understanding the basic biology of eating disorders, which was daunting as a foundation that did not have scientific expertise nor science staff. Um, it was really uh, in somewhat of a bold leap um, and, and the trustees embraced it and we went ahead and uh, the learnings from what was a fairly traditional grants program that I think is similar to the way a lot of private funders become involved in science, which is that there's an issue close um, that you're familiar with or that you're interested in, you know is a huge issue, you start looking at ways to support it. Um, that could be through supporting an institution. In our instance, it became um, one of supporting um, the best scientists and specifically attracting top level neuroscientists to a disease that had been sort of dismissed and not considered necessarily at the time to have a biological origin. We learned a lot from that. Um, and now I would say after um, many rounds of eating disorders grants and expansion to a global genetics initiative and um, uh, expansion to other areas, including um, a significant investment, and we'll hear more about this um, in partnership with the Yad Hanadiv with the Israel Precision Medicine Program and with the Israel Science Foundation on a number of um, ways to collaborate between institutions and specifically the Broad Institute in Cambridge and Israel, we have gone from a very targeted, specific um, and traditional grants program in one area of science to really looking at how do we help, um, how do we help impact and develop an ecosystem in Israel. So what have we learned from that? I think we've learned a lot of the things that are core to the foundation's principles and funding in other areas. I think that we've um, learned that certainly there's the power of um, learning from those who have already done this before. And we tapped into expertise from other funders and learned what they wish they had known. Um, we, we have um, learned a lot from including panels of scientists and actually looking at, you know, what do we learn from science? And we've, we've done this in Israel and we've done this in all of our scientific um, research efforts, which is what's known from the field? How do we get people from outside the field to also advise on how we might make a difference? And this has been incredibly powerful as we've been able to think more and more about what the role of the Klarman Family Foundation is. And we've also decided and shifted a little bit. The idea is not to say that we would be continuing to fund um, lots of different research projects 
um, and, and pools of funds on different topics. Instead, we've really shifted to say, what's, um, what are the ways that we as a private foundation can help generate resources and knowledge that will help advance other aspects of scientific research? And specifically knowing that private philanthropy is really so small relative to the largest investments in government, we have seen the role of private philanthropy and this foundation to take risks, to do some experimentation, to help generate and build some additional networks and knowledge and community that will attract some of the other larger resources like um, in the US, the NIH, um, to be able to invest in um, in different scientific fields. We certainly feel like we've done that in the field of eating disorders and specifically anorexia nervosa. And I think that actually that experience helped us become a little bit more comfortable in working in a much smaller environment in Israel where the funding is a little bit different. We've relied on partnerships with the Israel Science Foundation, um, which has not only um, expertise but a reputation of being able to really invest in high quality science across institutions. And I think the perspective of saying there is a role from for private philanthropy in particularly a smaller country where there are um, um, there are, are networks and collaborations that exist, there are strong institutions, there's government, and the ability of, of taking those lessons learned we had from a relatively small eating disorders program and saying the collaboration, the, the pushing on open access to learning and resources so that what's generated from what the what Klarman Family Foundation has invested in will be available for broader use in the scientific community um, and also to push on those policies and collaborations and networks all have come into play when we've been invested in Israel. It's a lot of sort of lessons learned or sort of an overview of the Klarman Family Foundation's journey. Um, it's one example of how one foundation here in North America has um, taken a specific interest and then broadened it to be invested in really basic biology and um, in the infrastructure of a particular country, in this case, the Israel's scientific landscape. I am gonna pause um, and I'm going to hand it over actually to um, Ruth Salzman, CEO of Russell Berry Foundation, who also, um, the foundation has a long history of different kinds of investments in, in science and in research, which includes both in the US and in Israel. And Ruth, um, if you can also share sort of the journey that, that you've been on and some lessons learned. With pleasure, thank you, Kim. As Kim said, I'm Ruth Salzman, the CEO of the Russell Berry Foundation, based in Teaneck, New Jersey with philanthropic interests ranging from the prevention, care, and cure of diabetes. That's the issue or the specific disease of focus uh, of the Berry Foundation, as, as Kim was speaking about, with uh, eating disorders and the Klarman Family Foundation. Our other philanthropic interests include the needs of our local northern New Jersey community, interfaith bridge building, and the strength and well-being of the state of Israel. In aggregate, we have provided over $320 million to our grantees. One third of our funding has gone to research and work adjacent to research with about 40% of that amount being spent uh, with grantees in Israel. We have been funding research from the outset, first with our founder, Russell Berry, who personally oversaw the investment in the creation of the Naomi Berry Diabetes Center at Columbia University Medical Center, a revolutionary concept at its time to resource both clinicians and basic researchers. Our second major initiative was the Russell Berry Nanotechnology Institute at Technion, launched in 2005 a gift that was made in Russ's memory after his death, of course. We have made other opportunistic grants to research, for example, to create the Researcher Entrepreneur Program at the Miguel Research Institute in Kiryat Shmona in the Upper Galilee. 
but our approach is best illustrated with the major relationships we've developed at Technion and at Columbia. Our approach is the following. We develop deep funding relationships with trusted partner institutions. We look for leverage from government and from other private funders. We invest in talent more than in buildings. We fund fellowships to junior researchers as a critical way to build a field over time. We incentivize collaboration and we utilize external scientific resources, not our own staff team, to advise our grant making and to help us assess progress, but we do so with full transparency to our grantees. Our grant to Technion was motivated very simply by our understanding that Israel could not afford to miss the opportunity of developing robust capabilities in nanotechnology a breakthrough scientific frontier of the 21st century. Shimon Peres had established nano as a national priority and our board responded with a unique public-private three-way partnership. The Berry Foundation provided $26 million, largest grant we have ever made in Israel, which was matched by the government of Israel and then matched again by other private donors to Technion. How do we measure the success of this investment? By establishing RBNI, Russell Berry Nanotechnology Institute, Technion led the way for other research universities to build nano initiatives of their own with substantial government support. And a major R&D platform was created for Israel as a whole. The initial 14 faculty members of RBNI has now grown to 110 with over 300 graduate students. Our funding in contribution to the ancillary Sidon multidisciplinary graduate program has graduated over 150 students with advanced degrees, 64 of them PhDs. 14 academic departments at Technion have relationships with RBNI. And as one very small marker, the official gift presented to Pope Benedict the 16th on his official visit to Israel was the Nano Bible created at Technion by Professor Uri Sivan, first head of RBNI and now president of the university and a member of today's panel. When we and other funders provided resources for research, we invested in capabilities that would explore known problems and seize opportunities that we could then imagine for the future. We're all taking pride now in Israel's efforts to combat COVID-19 across many fronts and disciplines, not only vaccines and therapies, but materials and training. Writ large, the infrastructure of scientific talent, capacity, and collaboration that result in it from investments in research made patiently and thoughtfully over time are a critical asset in confronting the current emergency. I will now pass the mic back to Kim and of course will happily uh, be available to respond to questions at the end of this session and subsequently. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and we're going to we're going to shift to um, Israel and to uh, Yasha Reagan, who oversees the academic excellence programs for Yad Hanadiv, and hear a little bit more about um, a slightly different approach to investing in research and science. Um, so, Asher. Thank you. Um... Hi, um, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'll say a few words about myself and then about Yad and Adiv, uh, overall approach, then try to illustrate it with one of the programs that Kim already mentioned, which is a partnership we've had in the area of precision medicine uh, for the last three or four years. Um, so I work at Yad and Adiv and I oversee our academic programs that we call academic excellence, which already hints towards our uh, priorities. Um, and like uh, Ruth said before, um, the question of scientific expertise and funding science is always one that we ask ourselves. My own background is a PhD in ancient Near Eastern studies. And I say that um, mostly to um, be able to 
come back to it when we talk about our work in biomedical research, we rely on scientific expertise outside the foundation. Uh, scientists are always very willing to help um, any program in giving specific advice and specific uh, input on areas of science where internally we don't have the expertise and therefore we don't have to limit ourselves happily to just my uh, limited area of interest and expertise in terms of academia. Um, in general, when we look at the academic system in Israel, it's, it's sort of complicated and, and seems big from the outside, but is actually much smaller from the inside. And this informs some of our work. That is, there are 60 institutions in Israel, universities, colleges, teacher colleges, um, but uh, the system itself has a budget which is about, from the government of about three and a half billion dollars a year, which is the equivalent of one large American university, a UC San Diego, for example, but it's spread out among um, three or four times as many faculty and many more students. So it's a resource poor environment on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, the funding that government does give uh, will dwarf anything that we can do as a funder. So we're always asking ourselves, what is our role specifically and where can we create some, some leverage and some unique opportunities? Um, I'll also say that uh, I think at least that the Israel's public higher education system is one of the crowning achievements of this country. Um, it's a public higher education system, it's excellent, it's affordable, it's accessible, and it allows Israelis to um, go through the education system here and reach almost anywhere in the world. And having these institutions as a resource is a strategic need for Israel. And I can't think of any major issue facing Israeli society, whether it's economic development, uh, quality of health care, reducing social gaps, um, democratic values, it doesn't involve higher education in some ways. Um, so keeping the, these institutions strong and vibrant is a major concern of ours. Um, of course, there are a lot of great ways to go about supporting science, and, and the truth is that we are pr probably not um, as focused and strategic as, as uh, we'd, we'd like to be, and, and we've done many different things over the years, and then since I've been at Yad and Adiv, but overall we do try to be guided by a few principles. One is to be strategic, that is the system is large, we have to find areas of particular interest, we're not guided by a specific disease, um, but by the opportunities to do excellent work, um, and so we try to define uh, areas that are uh, where we can uh, define short and medium term goals, um, understand what we're trying to achieve, um, and where our resources can have real impact, and we have strategies within the higher education areas uh, in the humanities, in promoting Arab excellence, that is the ability of Arab students to excel uh, in academia and beyond, and in precision medicine. And we try to take a national view of problems and not viewing them necessarily from the perspective of any one institution and, and try to see if we can provide some long-term systemic solutions so that the system will be um, better able to deal with the issues and to move forward even after we um, move on to different areas. And our focus is always on excellence. It is um, not everything can be funded. Um, the system uh, has a lot of other uh, resources that it can draw upon. Uh, and in general, not everything should be funded. Um, and so we try to find areas where we think Israel has the opportunity to be outstanding um, on an international level um, and to help them uh, thrive the long term. And um, I want to give an example of one of the areas where this has played out for us recently uh, within precision medicine, where we found that doing all of these things um, was much easier when we were able to build strong partnerships with other funders, with uh, additional organizations, universities and higher education organizations, and, and focus on sort of long-term systemic solutions. So in 2016 and 17, a lot of people, including uh, Yad and Adid, saw the opportunity in Israel to move uh, biological research forward um, in the areas of precision medicine, because Israel had always had very good researchers in biology, um, at the same time computational uh, methods were becoming much more impor important in, bio in biomedical research, and Israel was very good at computational uh, methods. Um, and Israel also had a very large clinical system that was relatively advanced, relatively digital, um, with digital records, um, and most patients divided into 80% of the patients are in two HMOs, and there are five or six large hospitals, and we thought if you could link biological research with the computational methods and the clinical system, Israel could uh, jump to the forefront of a very exciting scientific area that also has many benefits for Israeli citizens. And the challenges in this area were all systemic. Um, it was, there was no framework to support large collaborative research efforts. 
which you need in this area. You need doctors and computer scientists, you need biologists, and you need um, often mathematicians and, and others to, to perform research. And the research frameworks here just weren't large enough to support that. Relationships between hospitals and universities were limited and contentious very often. Um, Israel didn't have the policies, the infrastructures, and the regulations that, that could make the ecosystem work very well. And at times we found that individual institutions might be able to solve these problems for themselves, but at the same time they might be making things worse for others. That is, if one institution, one university, and one hospital signed an exclusive agreement um, to share data, it left other universities on the outside. Um, and we wanted to try to put researchers firmly in the driver's seat and to have them be able to build a system that would work for scientific reasons and help advance science and because it was good science and not because there were other interests at play. Um, the problem was honestly way too big for any for one foundation to deal with, certainly for ours, and we were lucky that we didn't have to approach it alone. And we uh, found in conversations with Kim, which we already knew each other from other contexts, we found that we had very similar interests uh, in this area um, in terms of our goals, not wanting to support individual projects per se, and, but to try to improve the entire ecosystem in some ways. We found the Israel Science Foundation as a wonderful partner focused on excellence uh, with a great reputation and uh, a partner that could be accepted by all the other players, the hospitals and the, the universities as um, a good framework to build a partnership and a collaboration between everyone. And, and this partnership allowed us to go beyond working on individual projects. You know, should we fund a project on cancer research or on diabetes? We had no particular tools within Yad and Deep to make these decisions, but the Israel Science Foundation could do it. So talk to a discussion of, you know, what does the ecosystem have to look like if we want it to thrive? Uh, it also helped us leverage our resources um, in, a, in a serious way. And here we took a, a, a page right out of the playbook of the Russell Berry Foundation with a nano initiative, um, which was an amazing initiative that managed to take a scientific area and turn it into an area of national prominence and um, where significant government funding was recruited. So we matched the Klarman Foundation and the government matched both of us. Um, and we were able to create a framework where the Ministry of Health, the Council for Higher Education and private philanthropy put enough resources on the table to get everyone to play according to rules that were system-wide rules. So rather than fund a few projects at two to four institutions, we, were, uh, we set up a, the Israeli Precision Medicine Partnership, which will ultimately fund 60 projects at 30 or 40 institutions. It will involve um, 80 to 100,000 Israeli patients, um, and it has the clout to influence government regulations, community standards, and the uh, daily practice of, of researchers in hospitals and in Israeli universities in ways that we would not have been able to do were we on our own. And, and these relationships also came into play very recently around the corona um, pandemic, uh, where we were able to come together uh, again with the Israel Science Foundation, uh, the Klarman Family Foundation, and with the Russell Berry Foundation, the Davidson Foundation, and the Wolfson um, Family Trust to launch a program where uh, for research into corona related uh, topics, again, run by the Israel Science Foundation with a real focus on excellence, but also with a new attention to uh, how does science impact uh, the priorities of clinicians and of the country trying to get back to work, um, which was a, a new shift uh, within the scientific community that we think in part reflects uh, the time they're spending together with physicians in, in this other research program and the fact that there was so much trust built between hospitals and the Ministry of Health and the Israel Science Foundation allowed us to come together as uh, private funders and to build a, a framework very quickly within, I think, three weeks of discussion to launch, and then two months later, actual grants being given out that, that have the potential to really make a difference um, in the way Israel is, is coping with, with the pandemic and maybe other countries as well. So, so the main lessons I've had from this uh, journey of the last five or six years is that finding other funders who are interested in your area and can each bring their particular expertise. Um, the Klarman Family Foundation had wonderful expertise on running scientific programs already in the US in relationship with the Broad Foundation. Um, Yad and Adiv as a local foundation had relationships with the Council for Higher Education, with universities and the ministries to be able to try to think of how we could come together and the Israel Science Foundation provided um, the scientific expertise and credibility we needed. Finding these sorts of partners um, are, is a really effective way to take something that matters to you and then leverage it in a significant way to, to make a sum that's, that's greater than all its parts. And, and of course, happy to answer questions later on. Thank you, Asher. 
Um, and you, you've seen now quite a cross section of different ways in which at least those around this screen have been um, both investing in science in Israel, but also evolving along the way. And that's a theme I think we'll come back to in some of uh, the discussion and questions. But first, I think um, we want to shift to hearing from someone who's not only an um, esteemed scientist himself, but president of the Technion, which is, of course, a major source of um, academic excellence, uh, nurturing the pipeline of next, um, the future generation of scientists, and also generating research that's been critical, not just to the history of Israel and Israel's position now as a leader in many areas, but also globally. So um, would love to hear your perspective, um, Ori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. And uh, what is it? Good morning for you, right? For most of you. Good morning. Uh, evening here. Uh, so few words about myself. Uh, I'm a physicist by training. Uh, most of my career was devoted to nanotechnology. You've already heard about the Russell Berry Nanotechnology Institute here at Technion. I was one of its founder and the first director. Um, I assumed I'm a new president. I assumed position on October uh, 1st and uh, not long after that, the COVID-19 uh, broke into our lives. So about half my term has been within the COVID-19. Uh, a few words about Technion uh, to those who are less familiar with that. It's the oldest university in the country. It's a technical university. Uh, we have a, a medical school though. We have uh, life science uh, departments, uh, physical science departments, course mathematics, uh, computer science, and very strong uh, engineering uh, uh, school. Before, uh, uh, I'll give you some perspective uh, of, of the Israeli universities during the COVID-19 uh, uh, period and the, the lessons we've learned from that. I, I'd like to, to mention to you that the funding system in, in Israel is in fact different than the funding system in the US. This is something which is very important to, to realize. It is also different than the funding system in uh, Europe. Uh, so here, uh, government funding, you know, if I take for instance, the Technion budget, which I know of course, uh, gov government covers approximately 70% of our budget, uh, about 35% of that uh, is to support teaching and uh, another 35% to support research. Uh, it's a public university, tuition is only 8% of our budget. So, and this is true for all Israeli universities. I mean, the, our budget is quite typical of, of other institutions in Israel, perhaps except for the Weizmann Institute, which is a research uh, institute and, and not a, a, a university. So you, you probably know, noticed that I mentioned teaching and I mentioned research and together, uh, together with tuition, it was only about 70, 70% of the budget. And the rest of the budget, approximately 25% of our budget comes from philanthropy. And in fact, this is almost exclusively the only source for development. Government support with except for some outstanding programs like, like the Russell Berry uh, or the Nanotechnology Initiative, or oh, now uh, uh, this uh, uh, initiative in uh, precision medicine and so on, but putting aside those very special programs, all of our development budget relies on philanthropy. Without philanthropy, we cannot build infrastructure. Uh, we cannot recruit 
new faculty members and equip their labs with cutting edge facilities. Uh, we cannot build labs and so on and so forth. This is very different com compared with public universities in the States and certainly with public universities in Europe. There, everything is funded by the government. There, there is no culture or hardly in Europe, hardly any culture of uh, philanthropy. So let me provide you my view of the importance of philanthropy. Well, I mentioned uh, it, or I described it uh, uh, budget-wise, but I would also like to, to, to describe the importance or uh, give you a feeling for the importance of long-term relations with, with, uh, uh, with phila uh, ph different philanthropy uh, funds. So let me tell you, I, I believe that the COVID-19 illustrates it wonderfully. So here is, here is the challenge. The spring semester started on my, March 18. Uh, on March 10th, we were instructed by the Ministry of Health to go online. So we had exactly eight days to go from frontal teaching to full online teaching. Of course, we have been working on online teaching before that and so on so forth, but never on such a massive uh, uh, scale. Personnel, I mean, almost simultaneously with that, uh, we experienced a, a shutdown, a massive shutdown uh, in the country or lockdowns. I, I should call it better, uh, call it uh, lockdown. Uh, so personnel was reduced first to 30% of our manpower and about a week later to 15% of our manpower. And remember, we are still teaching full-fledged 15,000 students on, online. All research labs were closed except for less than a handful working on COVID-19 research. So the campus was essentially closing down, everything going online. But within one month, just one month, over 50 labs on campus diverted their research to COVID-19 and therefore they were reopened. I mean, our all labs working on COVID-19 throughout the country were open throughout this crisis. So within one month, 50 labs, which is, I believe, a, a remarkable uh, number, and a dazzling spectrum of, uh, of topics from AI tools to help uh, decision makers monitor the disease and make decisions, diagnostics, drug delivery, protection gear for medical staff, and so on. And it was all handled with 15% of our normal uh, stuff. So what have we learned in that uh, process? Uh, first thing and probably main thing was that the Technion and also other universities are remarkably resilient to major crises. This is a very important uh, lesson because many universities around the world at least partially stopped functioning. But the universities in Israel, and I know of course best the Technion, continued functioning. It really showed resilience to this uh, crisis. Uh, it turned out to be flexible. We could have diverted manpower from uh, doing one thing to doing something uh, else, agile and robust. And then a question begs itself, which is what was the source of this resilience? And we gave it a lot of thought, I, I have to say, during the crisis and also late, uh, later in the, in the crisis. And the answer is very simple. The answer is continued massive investment in teaching, education, in community. Community is very important 
and research infrastructure. So most, and as I mentioned before, most of it was actually facilitated by philanthropy because infrastructure, teaching, educate, I mean, teaching infrastructure, education, uh, etc., were always supported by philanthropy. So my clear message is that th let there be no doubt we could have never been able to respond the way we did without major donations over decades that let us build this resilience. Uh, in, the in, in the interest of time, I've picked here only one example, which was already mentioned, uh, and that's the uh, establishment of the Russell Berry non-technology here at Technion with the help of the Russell Berry uh, Foundation, al also with the help of Yad Nadir and other uh, foundations. Um, but I, I believe that this is a really a unique and exemplary uh, uh, case, which I would like to, to elaborate a little bit, uh, partially because I was uh, deeply involved with this, uh, with this endeavor and led it for many, for many years. So the story goes back to 2003 when uh, President Tapiloik, the Technion president at that time, and VP Resources Development, Peretz Levy, who later became Technion president, is my predecessor, approached the Russell Berry Foundation with a proposal prepared actually by me to set up the first non-technology institute in Israel. And the need was $78 million dollars and the request from the Berry Foundation was $40 million out of it, about half of it. And then the Russell Berry Foundation, led by Angelica Berry and our late friend Norma Zayden, came up with a brilliant idea, which was later, in fact, adapted to other endeavors, national endeavors. Uh, it was revol revolutionary at that time. And the idea was they said that they are ready to, they will be ready to donate $26 million on the condition that the government of Israel contributed an equal sum and the Technion raised a similar sum from other sources, altogether $78 million. By the way, uh, within the first 10 years, investments in that institute grew up to something like uh, $120 million by far the largest uh, investment in any Israeli, in any Israeli uh, university. So the government, as I mentioned, stepped in and also the Technion, I mean, the condition was that Technion also raises similar sum from other sources, Technion stepped in. And in 2005, the Russell Berry non-technology at Technion was launched. Uh, funding served, as I mentioned before, it served research infrastructure, about half of it, half the budget supported research infrastructure, education programs, new education program, graduate program in uh, nanotechnology, uh, fa uh, faculty recruitment, dozens of faculty recruit recruitment, etc., etc. The reason I'm mentioning these items is because those items are normally not funded by the government. In this case, it was a unique case when the government stepped in with such a, a support. But it is also interesting to, to, to realize what effect this institute had on nanotechnology all over Israel. And as it turned out, the launching of this institute triggered a national program in nanotechnology and establishment of nano centers practically in all research universities uh, in the country so that in one decade, the total investments in Israeli nanotechnology was as high as 400, 450 million dollar. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because this nano wave in Israel 
transformed, nothing less of transformed uh, the research capabilities in Israel. It was probably the most important uh, uh, step up in our research uh, uh, capacity. Uh, since then, I have to, uh, I mean, uh, hundreds of startup companies were established in nanotechnology, thousands of graduate students graduated and found positions in academia, but also in industry. And the country was profoundly affected by, by, uh, this, by this nano uh, wave. Now, the seed was $26 million by the Raspberry Foundation. So you, you can imagine from here, or you can see from here, how large was the leverage on those $26 million. And this is probably a, uh, an, important, an important message. Uh, found, uh, philanthropic foundations should aim at seeding uh, major new research uh, efforts. And in my opinion, they should focus on those aspects that are not covered by government. Thank uh, the, you, Ori. The, the, the fund, sorry, uh, funding should, in my opinion, go to infrastructure, to education, and to recruitment of uh, new uh, faculty members. And I'm, I'm closing now, but just want to say that it also requires long-term relations and trust. And I believe that the trust we build both with the Adam Adib and uh, the Russell Berry Foundation is long lasting. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a, it's a good and important reminder of sort of the way um, at least the Technion has experienced um, right. interaction long term and investment um, with private philanthropy. I think it also highlights a couple of things and themes that I've heard that I want to just bring to the surface while I'm also going to encourage um, people to put questions in the Q&A. Uh, we've had one question which we will get to in a minute. Um, but I think that what's interesting and I, one point um, I want to make is that um, we've heard about some significant um, large investments that have been transformational both to an institution and to the way in which um, public private partnerships, for example, in Israel are considered. I think I want to make the um, one point that um, the amount of investment does not need to be as significant. Science can absolutely absorb lots and lots, uh, millions and millions of dollars. I do think, though, um, tying some threads together that have been um, heard throughout this, there's some really important opportunities that actually don't necessarily require such large multi-million dollar investments, but are about cultivating some of the relationships, um, bringing people together who might not always come together. We've certainly seen that um, over in with the Israel Precision Medicine Partnership, for example, thinking about um, bringing in expertise from other parts of the world or in specific issues that maybe um, Israel hasn't, hasn't thought about. Um, we have, for example, I'm thinking about small, relatively small, but seminars on um, the importance of accelerating resource sharing and looking at getting discovery to a broader, um, a broader set of scientists in the community than those who were originally involved in the research. That's been a principle I know of the Klarman Family Foundation, and that doesn't necessarily need a lot of significant dollars. It needs the, the sort of principle and the agreement. It's the way you structure it. If that's your, your goal, there are ways that you invest in continuing to push on that idea that science um, it is a very long-term investment, and it builds not just on the successes that we all read about in publications, but actually on the mistakes or things that don't work out. And those learnings are just as important to accelerate and to share as are the major breakthroughs. So we've heard about um, convenings. We've heard about the role of scientific advisors. We've heard about pipelines and different ways in which you seed things, which then enable others to 
um, join in or for larger sources of funding to be able to um, uh, to take it that much further, bring it to scale. One thing that we um, haven't touched on, the fact that science is such a long-term view, you might not know about the actual discoveries for many years out. Um, I'm wondering if either Ruth or Asher want to comment at all on how you think about evaluation and assessing the work. Um, certainly the role of scientific advisors has been mentioned as one way, but since that's something that is a little bit different sometimes than in other areas, um, any comments to share with the funders on the call? So I, I will start. Um, I gave a few of the examples of how we assess the success of the Nanotechnology Institute investment, but uh, perhaps I'll use an example for, that is domestic, which is uh, the uh, Columbia University Diabetes Center has a component that is a Berry Award and uh, a fellowship and Berry Fellowship of postdocs. So very, 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 very early scientists. And uh, we have renewed funding for that program four different times, most recently a year ago. We engaged an external evaluation firm um, that helped to advise us and to advise our, our grantee. And you know, I mentioned a few moments ago when I spoke that we are very transparent with our grantees. We let our, our partner institution know that we were engaging the evaluator. We involved them in not the design in, in the sense of, you know, of course we had the questions that we wanted answered, but we wanted them to understand what we were asking, why we were asking it, shared all the recommendations with them and were able together, I think, to come to a place of, you know, the, the third renewal and the fourth really benefited by having had that external evaluation. And it highlighted not very surprisingly, that we had made a choice and we continue to make that choice that investing in a postdoc still left a very big gap between a, a, you know, a recent graduate and somebody who was going to be able to begin to earn, to, to attract their own independent funding. And so we added a category, especially as the NIH funding became harder to get and the and, and the length of time became longer. We added a scholars program that provided funding that, again, was there as a, um, as a resource, building a bridge between a talented young scientist that we wanted to attract and cement to the field of diabetes research and have available while the slow working machinations of setting you know, up a lab and attracting NIH funding were working their way through. And we found it to be a very productive investment. And we have found that the evaluation was particularly helpful in pointing the way towards closing a gap that was fundamental to achieving our objective. Thank you. Um, Asher, I don't know if you had anything in terms of thinking about the, the very big question of evaluation when you're looking at long term. And I know I want to get to one question that's in the chat as well. Um, just to say that the, the time scale for evaluating science is very long, um, much longer than the programs themselves are. And you really can't set out with the objective of um, this is the result I want from this research. Um, I want a cure or a diagnostic or something that will be implemented. Um, the uh, goal you can establish is I want very good science to happen and that you can use intermediary evaluations of the quality of the, your selection committees and external scientists reviewing it. Um, we had a program that we funded, the Russell Berry uh, uh, Center at the Technion. We supported one of the graduate programs that combined nanotechnology and uh, life sciences. And there we had a very clear objective of I wanted to see those graduate students come through our own postdoctoral program. And once they started doing that, we knew that this was a very strong uh, program and we could assess that. So depending on what it is that you're funding, there are ways to get intermediary measures. And um, science has a very long term perspective though, and those are going to be much harder to evaluate within the framework of a foundation. Thank you. 
And the, the subject of postdocs has come up um, here and there's, there's obviously a whole pipeline and often I know lots of um, private funders do invest in programs for that pipeline to academia. And in the chat, there's a question from someone, um, a JFN member who is also um, a scientist and faculty member who is um, thinking or questioning whether anyone has heard about a special postdoc um, for outstanding students in Israel, knowing that right now um, the typical path is for uh, postdocs from Israel to go abroad and with travel restricted, are there any um, creative solutions that that anyone on the call knows of? I have not. Um, I don't know. You have, yeah. Marie? Or Asher? Well, um, sorry, Asha, would you like to respond? Just to I, say I can... that the Israel Academy of Sciences announced um, funding for postdocs to be carried out in Israel. Um, small number of uh, fellowships. We've, we have 25 postdocs a year that we fund and we've given flexibility for people to defer for a year if they feel that, that that's the right thing to do. Um, th this problem of postdocs uh, is, is an, a real issue. I mean, one has to appreciate the fact that there are different uh, populations there. One is uh, our, our PhD students who are just graduating and we're planning on to go on, on postdoc, but now they're stuck here in Israel. It's a different uh, challenge uh, than postdocs who are now elsewhere and need to come back. But we are working uh, with some uh, funding agencies that uh, typically fund uh, Israelis that go on postdoc elsewhere or uh, foreign postdocs coming over to Israel. We are working with them now to um, essentially divert their support to support Israeli postdocs staying, staying here, to support them. So we, in, in a sense, uh, we hope that the number of uh, postdocs doing their postdoc here will increase significantly. We are aware of the um, um, shortcomings of doing postdoc here as compared to the United States, but Israeli science is already pretty robust and we believe that we'll be able to send them elsewhere later, perhaps after they, uh, uh, um, they are appointed here, let's say as some assistant professor or something like that. So. We, we will adapt the whole academic uh, uh, process so that we can compensate for the fact that they can't go on their postdoc now. And the same is true for uh, postdocs who couldn't finish their postdoc, say in the United States, we will open uh, some avenues for them to be recruited now and we'll, we'll deal with the shortcomings uh, later. I think it's a um, it's a challenge. Certainly, everyone is addressing what what is the normal going to be, and how will postdocs and labs even work if there are, um, and and obviously depending on the topic, um, there's research and work that can be done remotely, and some that is is much harder. Part of the experience tends to be the culture too, and it, and the networking and the community building that goes with that, and it. It's a little early, I think, for us to know how that will will change the patterns of, of travel um, and experience. Um, there's one other question. I know we're just about at time. Um, if uh, about um, reflecting that the the Russell Berry um, Nanotechnology Center is an example from the mid 2000s that is really now coming to see how, what the impact has been. What would um, what topic would we be investing in now that would sort of create impact in another 10 years? I think you heard our Asher talk about one, which is sort of the precision medicine um, as, as an issue. I'm not going to comment on a specific area of science, um, but I will ask, is there quickly, Asher, Ruth, um, any topic that you would also offer? I wouldn't presume to future gaze. I think certainly not with Uri in the room. I would let him uh, yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good policy. Yeah. 
Well, I can say what, what are our focal areas. So, um, first of all, we raised uh, a, a very significant uh, donation by the Dealer Foundation, uh, $50 million, and uh, some other donations that at the level of integrated level of something like $20 million to establish uh, a quantum center focused on, on quantum technologies. So this is certainly one, made, one development direction for us. I believe that human health uh, is going to be exceedingly important. And in fact, we are now, uh, I would say restructure all of our research on campus, combining I mean, everything from the uh, patient bed in collaboration with Rambam through our medical school, life sciences, engineering department, physical sciences, and so on and so forth, uh, lumping it together around human health. That's a major thing for us. Another one is sustainability. No doubt that sustainability is going to be more and more important. And last one is education. We need to adjust education to, to, to the 21st century. We invest heavily in that. So at least for us, these are the major development directions for the coming uh, years. But if I may, just one second about, you know, you were mentioning that small donations are also important. And I perfectly agree with you. I mean, really the, the, those mega endeavors I was mentioning create the impression that small, smaller donations are unimportant. This is not true. If they're invested wisely in seeding up, in seeding important, uh, uh, important projects, then they are very meaningful. You know, it's just like a startup. At the beginning, you invest little in it. But seeding is very important. The first 1 million, 2 million could be, could make a whole difference. So uh, that, that was my point about smaller investments. Well, thank you. And thank you. I know we're at time. Tamar has come on. Um, again, we, we knew we weren't going to be able to cover the whole breadth. I hope that at least it was um, an introduction to how the people on the screen view the role of private philanthropy in investing in science um, in Israel. Thank you, Asher, Ruth, and Ori. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I want to echo that, what Kim just said. I want to thank Kim, Asher, Ruth, and, and Uri for their really interesting presentations. And also say, I know this was just the start of a conversation. I know we could go many more hours and there's so much to dive deeper in, and we hope to be able to do that in this forum and in different forums in the coming months and years. So please look out, out for that. And you can reach out to me at tamar at jfunders.org if you have any other questions or future ideas for different programs. So thank you again to all the panelists for your, for your um, presentations and for your partnership in putting all of this together. And I look forward to learning again to, and speaking again together soon. Thank you.